Hallelujah. Well, the Most High be praised. We bless the Almighty for this day. We praise Him for His kindness and His goodness to us. We want to welcome each one of you who are joining us by live stream today. I want to say shalom to you. Trust that your day has been a blessed one and that you have been encouraged in the Almighty. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that Yahuwah is good, his mercies endure forever, and his truth to every generation. I'm so grateful for this season that we are in. Hallelujah. Before the going down of the sun, we were in the 10th day of the month of Abib. Abib is the first month of our new year. Abib means ripe barley. And so what it indicates is that when the new moon begins, and it is declared Abib, that means the new moon or the month represents the time in which the barley harvest is to occur. And during that same time frame, of course, we prepare for the Passover. And so we're grateful <clears throat> For this month, uh, the reason why I made mention of the uh, the day prior to the sun going down is because uh, we've just finished the tenth day of a bee, and so one might wonder why is the tenth day of a bee important. So what I want to do, I want us to go to the book of Shemot, book of Shemot, Shemot, the book of names, it is commonly called Exodus in your Bibles. And we want to go to chapter 12 of Shemot, commonly called Exodus. And we want to read the first six verses first six verses from Shemot. And we're going to read, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 12. Yahuwah said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Mitzrayim, that's Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of the months of the year for you. Speak to the whole community of Israel and say that on the 10th of this month, each of them shall take a lamb to a family, a lamb to a household. But if the household is too small for a lamb, let him share one with a neighbor who dwells nearby in proportion to the number of persons. You shall contribute for the lamb according to what each household will eat. Your lamb shall be without blemish, that means without defects, a yearling male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep watch over it until the 14th day of this month, and all the assembled congregation of the Israelites shall slaughter it at twilight. The Almighty be praised. Today I want to share a word with 
respect to the cons with respect to um, the celebration of Passover, I find that it is fitting to say something about the celebration of Passover as we get prepared for this Moedim. We plan to celebrate the Passover and eat the Seder on the 28th of this month of March, commonly called March, but we know that that will be the 15th day of Abib that we will actually eat the Seder meal. Some might be thinking, why do we eat the Passover on the 15th day when the 14th day is considered Passover? I'll answer that. That is because on the 14th day is the day that the lamb is slaughtered. And the lamb is slaughtered during the time that is called twilight. Well, that means it's during the time prior to the going down of the sun. And that's somewhere around about, say, what we would call between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Somewhere within that time frame, during the latter part of the daytime, is when the lamb is slaughtered. And after the lamb is slaughtered during the latter part of the 14th day, it is then cooked and prepared to be eaten. Now when the sun goes down, around about that time, the slaughtered lamb would have been cooked and prepared and made ready for eating. When the sun goes down, it would be the end of the 14th day of Abib and the beginning of the 15th day of Abib. Now, does that make sense to everybody? So when the sun goes down, it will end the 14th day of Abib where the lamb had been slaughtered. And as we enter into the 15th day of Abib, that's when we will partake of the Seder meal. That's when we eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Okay? So when you hear me say that we will be celebrating the Pesach meal, that's when we eat the lamb. That's always done at night in the beginning of the 15th day of Abib. So I hope that that makes sense to everyone so that you'll understand that that's the process. Um, many times when individuals read the scriptures and they see that the Bible says that the 14th day of Abib is the Passover, they immediately think, oh, we're going to eat the Passover meal on that day. No, the lamb is slaughtered on that day. And when the sun goes down, closing out the 14th day and the beginning of the 15th day, that's when we begin to eat the Passover meal. All right? So I just wanted to uh, emphasize those particulars so that we understand when we are eating the Passover meal and why it is done on the 15th day. Okay? Now, the reason why... Uh, the tenth day is important, which just closed, because right now we're in the eleventh day with the going down of the sun. But the reason why the tenth day is important, because that is the day when the lamb is set aside. When the Passover lamb is taken from the flocks, either of the sheep or of the goats. The lamb must be within a year of age. It must be a male. Once it is taken, it is set aside 
and it is looked after until the 14th day in which it will be slaughtered. So we see this in the scriptures that we read here in Shemot, commonly called Exodus, the first six verses of the 12th chapter. And what we are looking at here is something that I believe the Almighty is trying to show us. Because when we celebrate these Moedim, these appointed times, Passover being one of them, when we celebrate them, it is important that we begin to start recognizing the message that Elohim has placed in the information he's given to us about the Moedim as it relates to our King Yahshua. See, what is very important for us to understand as we see the significance of these biblical feast is these appointed times as we begin to start looking at what is important with respect to them and our Messiah Yahshua is that all of these Moedim were given as institutions to point to Yahshua there's a passage in the Bible found over in the book of Revelation. And the passage is a part of a song that was being sung. And it says, with respect to Yahshua, that he is the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Literally, it should be that he is the lamb slain from the foundations of the universe. And what that means is, if we're to look at that scripture verse, literally, it means that going back to the foundations of the creation of everything, Yahshua had already been declared the lamb that would be slain. The revelation in that is that before everything was created, it had already been considered in the mind of Yahuwah that Yahshua would be the one that would die for the sins of Israel and of all of the nations who believe on Elohim through Yahshua and join Israel. We would commonly say for the sins of the whole world. We see that this concept has already been considered which means Elohim already knew that men were going to sin before he would even create them. It had already been considered. So with that in mind, what that teaches us is that every one of these feasts were given by the foreknowledge of Yahuwah. In other words, when Passover was given to Moses, when he was given the instruction about celebrating the Passover, the Most High had already taken into consideration that this was going to be a message that would be given to the Israelites about the one who would become the true Pesach Lamb, Yahshua. The Most High was already putting messages in the earth realm through these feasts because ultimately the purpose for them was to reveal to Israel and the nations the message of the Passover lamb who is indeed the Messiah. 
So we start to see this unfolding. Everything that the Mosai said about the Passover lamb, it had to be a male, that this Passover lamb could not have any defects. When the Bible says that there to be no blemishes, it means that the lamb was not to have any defects. It means it couldn't be sick. That means that it couldn't have any bro broken bones. It had to be a lamb that was healthy and the best of the best. And that lamb that represents being the best of the best, without blemish, no broken bones, is the perfect representation, the complete representation of the Messiah who is regarded as the sinless one, the one with no defects. And so the Most High was showing us through the symbolism of the Passover lamb how that the figure in the Passover lamb would point to the Messiah. Now what I find that's interesting when we consider the time frame in which the lamb was to be taken from the flock and set aside and watched for three days until coming to that fourth day, which would be the 14th day, when the lamb would be slaughtered, I see some, some uh, symbolism in how when our Messiah, Yahshua, came on the scene, how he was set aside to perform the work and ministry of the Father. He was baptized of John the Baptist. And once he was baptized of John the Baptist and entered his formal ministry, he was with the disciples for three years. And after that three-year period of being seen, by not only the disciples, who later became the apostles, and also of the multitudes being seen those three years by the masses of people in northern Israel and also in southern Israel when he would go down to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And in Samaria, when he would pass through that area, we know that there's an instance of him going to that area when he met the woman at the well. And we don't know how many uh, people he probably encountered in Samaria. All we have is that written record of the woman at the well, but he may very well have passed through Samaria a number of times and had impacted the lives of people there. We don't know. But we do know that while he was here in the flesh, that there were untold numbers whose lives were affected. And it was during that three-year period. So when we look at the lamb being set aside from the flock and then being observed for three days, until the fourth day came where he would then be slaughtered. We see symbolism there. But now, after looking at all of this and seeing the similarities of the Passover lamb and seeing how that connects with our beloved Savior, I need to say something with regards to the fact that Passover continued to be celebrated after our Messiah died and rose from the dead. Now, the need for me to bring this up is due to the fact that in this current 
Christian generation, in particular, the uh, Western Christian churches, there has been a teaching that the law, quote unquote law, that, that, that means the writings of the Torah with the commandments, statutes, and judgments have been done away. And of course, that particular teaching and belief is derived from a couple of verses that have been taken out of context because if we go back and look at the context of the verses that these ideas came from, which are from a couple statements that Paul makes, where Paul makes a statement and says that the law has been done away or it has been interpreted that the law has been done away. It actually talks about the dogma of commandments, which is the interpretation of commandments, has been nailed to the tree. But I've done a teaching on that uh, where we address Paul's statements from the proper Hebraic perspective. But because these ideas about the law being done away, being removed, has come into the fabric of Western Christian teaching, we have this understanding that Passover is not to be celebrated by quote-unquote Christians. And if you were to ask a Christian in this 21st century, hey, if you would ask a Christian in the 20th century, going back all the way to the 4th century, they would tell you that Passover is something that the Christian does not celebrate, that it is a practice of the Jews, and that it has been done away, even as the law has been done away and that there is a new law now. And, you know, I have to bring this up because when we discuss the Passover celebration, those who may be watching who may not be familiar with the practice of the Messianic Israelite community and in our promotion of Passover, and in our teaching about the Passover, those who are not familiar with that teaching that is held by us and many others who agree with the celebration of Passover, they will want to emphasize that that stuff is for the Jewish people, that stuff is based upon the law, and we as Christians are not under the law, then we're not supposed to do it. And there again, as I mentioned, these concepts are based upon a misunderstanding of statements made by Paul, a misrepresentation of what Paul has said, and a misinterpretation of even what the Messiah has said. Because there's a passage in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where the Messiah said, I have not come to destroy Torah or the prophets, I've come to fulfill them. And what happens is the reader of the text stops right there at that particular passage where uh, the Messiah makes that statement and they don't continue reading down to the 19th verse of Matthew chapter 5. Because if you continue to read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, and you continue, what you will find is that the Messiah says, when he says that I have not come to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but I've come to fulfill them, that term fulfill means to complete them. And what he is actually saying is that I've come to bring a completion 
to the writings of the scriptures. Because as you continue to read in verse 18, the Messiah says that heaven and earth will pass away first. I want you to listen to that. Go back and read it. He said heaven and earth, heaven and earth will pass away first before the jot or the tittle will pass from the Torah. Now the jot, for those who are not familiar with the English translation and its verbiage, the jot refers to the yod or the yut or the yad in the Hebrew. That's the Hebrew letter, the yod. Back in the time of the Messiah, they were using both the Paleo-Ancient Hebrew and also the Aramaic, which they call the Modern Hebrew Script. And in the Modern Hebrew Script, the Yod looked like an apostrophe. And it was the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, at least according to what they were using at that time in the first century. But then the tittle... The tittle is in Hebrew called the comets. It is a part of a letter. It's like, it's like the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I. That's basically what it's regarded as, a part of a letter. So what Yahshua was trying to say to his audience when he makes the statement about the fact that he has not come to do away with the Torah and the prophets because that's a phrase which means books of scripture. What he was saying was that nothing in the Torah and the prophets are going to be removed. He was emphasizing the permanence of the Torah and the prophets, the books of scripture, and that he would actually bring a completion to those books of scripture, which is what we have in the writings of the apostles. We have the completion of that. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because Matthew 5.17 has been interpreted improperly because some will say that, well, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law so we don't have it anymore. And they don't continue reading the rest of those verses because Yahshua went so far as to, as to say not only would the smallest letter and the part of a letter of the Hebrew alphabet remain until heaven and earth pass away. And we all know that heaven and earth hasn't passed away yet, right? So that's a clue to us that the Torah and the prophets are still effective. In other words, they are still supposed to be kept. They have not passed away. But the Messiah continued. When you get down to that 19th verse, listen to what the Messiah says. And, and he says, he makes this statement, and he says, Whosoever does not keep the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so shall be least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall keep the least of these commandments and teach others to keep the least of these commandments, he says that person will be great in the kingdom. So when we look at scripture in its proper context and consider what was the message Yahshua was trying to convey to his audience in Matthew chapter 5 when he was speaking to them, what we really discover is what he was saying was that the, the Torah is remaining permanent as the scriptures. In other words, he's saying what you understand to be the scriptures is not going to be thrown in the trash can. So I know it took a little while to say that because I wanted to emphasize the permanence of the scripture, all of it, with respect to speaking about Messiah keeping Torah as permanent. We had made mention of the fact that the Messiah in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, told us that basically the Torah would be permanent. 
and that he wanted to make sure that his audience knew that the Torah would still be in effect. That's so important for us to understand, especially when we look at this celebration of the Passover. We need to first of all know that the Passover is celebrated because the scriptures that are permanent and remain in effect tell us that Passover is to be celebrated. So since the Torah gives us all of these commandments and they have not passed away but remain in effect until heaven and earth passes, we know that Passover is still to be kept. Another thing that I want to bring out has to do with the fact that the renewed covenant, which according to Hebrew thought, began with John the Baptist when John the Baptist started baptizing, that was the initiating of the era of the renewed covenant. Now some say, well, after the death of the Messiah is when the new covenant began. No. The death of the Messiah with the shedding of the blood was the ratifying of the covenant, but when Messiah was baptized by John the Baptist, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, that was the beginning of the renewed covenant. Now, someone would say, well, 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 why is that? Because in Hebrew thinking, baptism brings you into the covenant. So during that time when John the Baptist was baptizing and he was calling only Israelites to baptism, it had caught the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And they said, look, we got to check this guy out. Because he is not just preaching, but he is calling Israelites to baptism. They knew that only the Messiah could do that and that that was a sign that the renewed covenant had come. You see... See, when you call an Israelite to baptism, that's an indicator that your covenant you have with Elohim is broken. <laughs> you see, that's why when the religious leaders came to John the Baptist, they asked John the Baptist, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you that prophet? He said, who are you? He said, are you the Messiah? He said, no, no, no. Then they said, then why are you baptizing? Because they knew only the Messiah or someone connected to the Messiah could initiate baptism because it meant that a new covenant or renewed covenant was on the scene. So now we have the evidence that the renewed covenant was on the scene. And with the renewed covenant being on the scene, I want y'all to roll with me, with the renewed covenant being on the scene, what that tells us is that everything that the Messiah did, everything that he practiced, Everything that he taught was within the framework of the fixing of this renewed covenant. Just like back in the time when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the commandments. The Most High had already initiated the covenant with the Israelites in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 19, read that. The Most High said to Moses, go tell the people if they keep my covenant, they'll be my people. The people said, we'll do everything that Elohim says. We'll keep his covenant. The Most High then said, tell them to go wash their clothes, which, which is a phrase meaning go get baptized. And then meet me at the mountain and I'm going to give you commandments. Messiah did the same thing. Baptism had already came into effect showing that a new covenant had came on the scene. Messiah gave commandments. After the death of the Messiah, the covenant was ratified. The same way in which the book of the covenant was ratified after the spilling of blood. All right? So we see all of those um, symbolisms. But the thing that I'm trying to draw attention to is the fact that Everything the Messiah did and celebrated was all within the framework of this renewed covenant. You see, the, the only way in which we can really understand this is that we have to understand it from a Hebraic position. See, we have been trained to see things from a Western Christian theological perspective, which does not incorporate 
the Hebrew understanding. All right? Now, I've just dealt with the second point that I want to help to establish the basis for why we believe that Passover should still be kept. Now, here's the third evidence. Here's the third evidence I want to present. There is a document called the Apostolic Canons. And in this document called the Apostolic Canons, in canon number four, we have a statement made with respect to keeping the Passover. Now, the Apostolic Canons was produced in the second century. And a man by the name of Clement, he was uh, one of the leaders during that time. He was discipled by one of the 12 apostles. He brought forward the teachings of the apostles to the generation that was living in the second century. In this canon, listen to what it says, canon number four. It says, concerning the day on which the Pesach should be celebrated. If any bishop or elder or deacon celebrates the holy Pesach with the Jews before day and night are equal, that's the vernal equinox, let him be deposed. So what we find in this canon here is that it has already been considered that Passover will be celebrated. The issue of Passover being celebrated or not wasn't in question. See, they were already celebrating Pesach with the unbelieving Judean Israelites. That had been happening ever since the time of the first century. But now, getting into the second century, and there has been more of a divide between the sect of the Nazarenes and the sect of the Pharisees, when you find Clement writing this, he wants to ensure to the Messianic Israelite community that they celebrate Passover on the day in which Passover has always been celebrated. It's supposed to be celebrated after the vernal equinox. The day in which daylight is the same as night. Basically, you have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. That's the first day of spring. See, Passover is always celebrated after the first day of spring. You know, those of us who follow the lunar calendar, we always celebrate it after the first day of spring. That's where it ends up. But it's possible that the reason why this here was noted is because the sect of the Pharisees began to make some changes to a number of things that were original to our Israelite faith. One of those things that the sect of the Pharisees did, and, and when I say sect of the Pharisees, that's the sect that morphed into or that produced what is presently called rabbinic Judaism. Okay? One of the things that they did was create an intercalated calendar, which is basically a preset calendar where you have 29 days, then 30 days, then 29 and 30 days in the calendar, and then every three years you have an extra month thrown into the calendar, which is a leap month called Vedar. So, they basically set up this calendar for convenience purposes. And when they did that, what possibly might have happened during one of these times when the vernal equinox may have come after one of the dates of Passover that they had according to that intercalated calendar, those who were following the moons and the crescent, and the sighting of the barley, the abib, to determine when the new year would begin. Because for us, when we do that, we will always celebrate Passover at a time that is after 
the vernal equinox, always. So it is probably, it's probably because of some changes that the Pharisaic rabbinic Jews were doing at this particular time, which is the reason why Clement made the statement. But the point that I want to bring out here is that our second century Messianic Israelite fathers were celebrating the Passover. This is the thing that is really awesome here. Because in our time, we have been taught that the Torahs passed away. We have been taught that you don't celebrate the feast because that's for the Jews. But what we fail to realize is that all of those ideas came about in the 4th century. Those ideas weren't around in the 2nd century when this document was produced. And so it's important that we understand that for those of us who are desirous of practicing our faith in the manner in which Messiah laid it down, because the scripture says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. If we are to celebrate it the way he established it and the way the apostles brought it to us, then based upon that foundation and based upon the evidence we see, in the writings of the apostolic canons, we find that Passover was celebrated by our ancient Messianic Israelite fathers. See, we have three foundational evidences here. And I wanted to communicate this because there are many who are skeptical about celebrating Passover because they have been taught through the Western Christian theological systems that Passover is a Jewish thing. It's not a Christian thing. It's not for you. But you, my dearly beloved brother and sister in the Messiah, have been misinformed. See, your Messiah celebrated Passover, and those who came after the Messiah, after the Messiah had died and risen and ascended, the second century believers based upon the evidence of the writing of the apostolic canons, those believers continued to practice the celebration of Passover. And I want to encourage each and every one of you in Yahshua to celebrate the Passover. I want to encourage you to begin to understand that this is a part of your heritage. This is a part of your faith. I want you to understand that despite what you have been told by your Baptist pastors or your Church of God in Christ pastors or your apostolic faith or your Catholic or Lutheran pastors, what, whatever denominational structure you might be a part of, and I don't wish to throw stones at the denominational structures, but I have to convey the truth and I have to show the comparisons and contrasts between what was actually practiced by our earliest predecessors in the faith and those who came after. You see, our faith was changed and modified in a number of different ways. And many of us are completely unaware of it. And so this is why I'm bringing this information to us. So that we may have, first of all, the evidence from Scripture, the evidence from the Hebraic cultural concepts with regard to the renewed covenant and when the renewed covenant began, and also from the evidence provided by the apostolic canons, a document that goes back to the second century, showing us that they were celebrating Passover because in the canon, the issue was in the canon as to when the Passover would be celebrated. Not as to whether it should be celebrated or not, but when the Passover should be celebrated. That it should be celebrated after the first day of spring or the vernal equinox. 
And so I trust that this information that we have shared has been helpful to you, that it has enlightened you, that it has encouraged you, that it has caused you to rethink your position with respect to celebrating Passover. Because this is something that our Messiah did. And the saints of the first few centuries continue to do. And it is revelation to us that have been misinformed and have not practiced it. You know, when you begin to practice these Moedim, I tell you, it will cause your relationship to Messiah to go up. That's what's happened with me. That's what's happened with my family. That's what's happened with so many who have come to the understanding of this suppressed truth that the Messiah, through the Ruach, his spirit, is bringing back to Zion. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage each and every one of you today to celebrate the Passover. And for those of you who have never celebrated and you're probably thinking, well, I don't know what to do. How do I celebrate it? Glad you asked. You know, you can go to our website and you can get a Passover ceremony. We have the Passover ceremony that you can download from our website. Our website is www.ncmmi.20m.com. You can go to Celebrating the Moedim. If you go to the NCMMI links, and scroll down, you'll find a link called Celebrating the Moedim. Click on that link. When you get to that page, you want to go down to the bottom of that page. It has a list of the dates and the feast. It's a calendar of the feast. You want to go down to the bottom of that page, and you will find a Passover ceremony. You want to click on that and download it. And that way, you have the information, the script, that will guide you through the celebrating of the Passover. And so we want you all to be mindful of that. We want you to celebrate the Passover. And uh, we will be online on uh, this Sunday, uh, March 28th. That is the day in which we will be celebrating the Passover at sundown. And you can celebrate with us by live stream while you have the Passover celebration. Uh, ceremony of your own. Well, we trust that this teaching has been a blessing to each and every one of you. I want to say thank you to all of you who have uh, been patient and who have participated in the teaching. I trust that it has been a blessing to you and that it has encouraged you. Hallelujah. Before we get ready to close, let's have a word of prayer. Abba Yah, thank you so much for your mercies, your graciousness, your kindness. Thank you for this opportunity to provide this teaching. I pray that it has encouraged and strengthened your people, that it has caused those who have never heard about Passover to desire to want to celebrate Passover. I pray for those who are unbelievers that may be watching, that their hearts and their minds might be touched, that they might turn to you in repentance and begin to give thanks to you for the sacrifice that our Messiah gave, being our Passover lamb. Hallelujah. And Father, we will bless your great name. Touch everyone on this day. May they be encouraged. May they be strengthened. May they be informed from this teaching. And we bless you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Amen. For those of you who have watched us for the first time, we thank you for watching. We trust you have been encouraged. If this has been a blessing to you and has strengthened you in your faith, please consider giving a donation unto Elohim through this ministry. Your donation helps us to continue to do the work of the Almighty. It helps us to get this word out to the nations and to provide resources for those who are not able to obtain those resources on their own. But most of all, we want to ask you to pray for us that we may continue to be a light and a source of giving the word of Elohim to the nations. See, our desire is to bring truth 
unadulterated, and to inform Zion of the way of the Creator. And I trust that those of you that have been watching have been receiving that truth. Well, we thank each and every one of you again, and we pray for your families. We speak blessing over your homes, and that you may be encouraged, and that the shalom of Elohim rest, rule, and abide upon you, both now and forever. Thanks again for watching. Shalom.